we've got a few uh, announcements on choir practice tonight at 5 p.m. And then uh, um, Saturday, November the 2nd, 10.30 through the 11 uh, through the eleven o'clock hour, and that's, or until 11. And that's um, uh, the night or uh, the day before. No, the cantata is the uh, December. Okay. Do I have that right, Ellen? December 15th, yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Alliance Women, November the 4th, and the uh, Thanksgiving dinner. And celebration is November the 24th, that Sunday. Family Promise the first week in December. And Cantata on the 15th. Anything to add to the calendar? How did uh, uh, Clark's uh, envision go yesterday? It was very good. It was raining the entire day and it was cold. But we set up the thrift store, and kids and family showed up to buy gloves and hats and raincoats and socks. Um, so they came out in the rain, and we had people fur walking slash telling them the thrift store was open. And I got reports that people were so excited that the thrift store was open, they ran over to the thrift store to see what we were doing and just catch up with us. The students did a great job. We were part of a house church um, in the morning, and they got to hear testimonies from refugees of God's faithfulness and how the Holy Spirit is alive and how to listen to him. So it was a great time of ministry from start to finish. The students did a really good job. Wonderful. When are you headed to Florida? Next, this upcoming Saturday. Saturday. So about a week. And how long? For about a week? You'll be back in? No, I'm gone two weeks. Two weeks. Mm -hmm. okay. We'll miss you. But Amanda is going to uh, secure funding for another year, or hopefully two years, for working with Envision. Uh, so please be praying for her for success in uh, raising those funds down there. How many churches do you go see? Uh, at least two with a potential third. Okay. Um, so ask the Lord to guide her in that and to uh, open the, uh, the hearts and the pocketbooks <laughs> of, the, of the folks there. Um, uh, also uh, uh, be praying for her ministry uh, with the kids and with Envision um, and here. And uh, let's keep, uh, keep her in prayers. Anything else that we need to be praying for you about? Um, well, we're wanting to hire a refugee on the, in the thrift store next year. So prayer that that person, that God will pick that person for us, that all the funding will go through to become a nonprofit so that all of our resources can go to training and hiring and supporting families that want to have local jobs. Because right now they're taking graveyard shifts at chicken factories an hour away. Um, so they can't see their families during the day. They can't come to house searches. They can't be part of the community. Um, so the more we can train and hire, the more access we have to show them other ministries. So pray that we can get to that place. And how was um, a pastor's retreat for you? Very good. Yeah, going to be doing soul care, getting together with other pastors, networking, receiving. It was a good retreat. It's a big state. Prayer for the persecuted church uh, this week, Psalms 52 through 59, and there is a, an urgent re uh, request for prayer for the uh, Syrian uh, Christian Missionary Alliance, particularly, but also for the um, for the other Christians that are uh, there in Syria. Uh, this actually made national news um, in uh, some of the, the weekly um, secular magazines. It's, uh, it's a real big, uh, big stuff. So please be praying for um, your brothers and sisters around the world. Um, we're uh, in the process of uh, working on the budget for next year. Uh, Jimmy is putting the numbers together. And Dave Rainwater has <clears throat>
taken uh, the mantle of, uh, of heading up a committee uh, to work up the budget. So if you have any questions, any comments, any ideas that you would like to share uh, with the committee, please get in touch with Dave. Uh, he's not, not hard to find, so you can uh, uh, talk with him and, and uh, let him know what your thinking is. Do you have anything you want to to encourage them with, Dave? Uh, just be praying about this because, as we know, uh, each year has a whole new opportunity and a whole new challenge. So we just need to be uh, seeking the Lord's wisdom. Amen. Any other um, announcements, comments? Let's join our hearts together. Father, we come to worship you. We come out of your invitation and your command. And we ask, Lord, that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lead us in repentance. And open our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. We confess our total need, our great dependence upon you. And we ask, Lord, fill us with your spirit. We thank you in Jesus' name. There are responsive reading sections in the bulletin, the emboldened sections, if you would join in in reading uh, those. The Lord is calling us to himself. Revelation chapter 4. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Will you stand with me? Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. Hymn number two, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
The Lord is saving us in Christ Jesus. Listen for the themes. You recognize, of course, that this holy, holy, holy that we just sang is out of Isaiah's encounter with the Lord God Most High in the temple. But then the scripture that we read is the same expression from Revelation. When in the Holy of Holies in heaven, the same acclamation is being made. Listen for the motifs of Revelation in the rest of the scripture that we sing and that we read today. And the songs. In Isaiah chapter 25, the Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all the peoples on this mountain. A banquet of aged wine and choice pieces with marrow and refined aged wine. And on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering which is over all the peoples. Even the veil which is stretched over all nations. He will swallow up death at that time. And the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces. And he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. For the Lord God has spoken, and it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited, that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Hallelujah. Like a river glorious, hymn number 340, the water from the throne.
wrote to, to the Corinthians. By his doing, you are in Christ, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness from God, and sanctification from God, and redemption from God. Amen. Be thou my vision. In number 328.
scriptures for the first part of this week. I've got to come back to reality. This is reality. You are reality. To see God's love on you. It's a profound moment. To see his delight for you and his intention. thank you for the salvation that you brought to each one of us in our personal history in our lives. We thank you that while we were yet sinners, you loved us and you sought us out, that Christ died for us 2,000 years ago, and you were able to capture our minds, our hearts, our, our imaginations, even our bodies to hold us still long enough for us to hear the good news of life, of faith, of hope, of love in Jesus. We come here today, Lord, to celebrate our salvation, our relationship with you, our being born from above. And we praise you for it. We know that it isn't an issue of our works, of our righteousness, of anything good that we ever did, but that it is sure, pure, sheer grace. And we all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you. And Father, thank you for protecting our steps and over the length of our life with you to lead us to this place on this morning with this job to do, to glorify you, to encounter you, to believe you, to grow in you, and to love you. And just like it took you to get us saved, we know it takes you to get us to love one another. And so we open ourselves up to you and we ask, Lord, do it. As you saved us, so love through us, please. That you would be glorified and that the world would believe that you're actually real. You're actually true. Touch us as evidence of your glory. And help us, Lord, to stand fast in this day, in this culture, to not be discouraged, to not be tempted away, to not be confused, but to be steadfast and robust and alive. Strong and victorious in this life, in this day. <clears throat> Father, you know the time, and we know we don't know the time of Jesus' coming. But, but we are convinced that the time is short, and so we pray that you would awaken us and give us the unction that we need to live rightly in this life. To live a life of courage. To be brave in the faith. Protect us from being cowards. And Father, remove from us our inordinate self-love. And fill us with your divine love. We pray for our community. With the multiple challenges and difficulties. Help us to, one, believe that we are the 
salt of the earth, the light of the earth, and two, to be the salt and to be the light and to live with Christ every day in every circumstance. Help us to witness to the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. He is alive. pray that you would protect the message of the gospel preached here at home and in our community and our nation and around the world. And that again, today would be a day of salvation. We praise you. And we glory in you. Help us in our weakness. Be exalted. Well, you're in trouble today, not because I have eight pages, but because the battery in the clock has stopped, and so it will forever be five minutes after seven. Five. Five minutes after five. I don't know what that means, but until I see that second hand moving, I'm not, I'm not convinced. You know what it means when the preacher takes his watch off and he puts it up here? It means absolutely nothing. <laughs> Today we're talking about a new heaven and a new earth. Yeah, hallelujah. Not just Revelation talks about this thing, but the whole Bible has been leading up to it. All the way from Genesis, all the way through. The two, the heavens and the earth, become one. This vision in Revelation concludes with chapter 21 and 22. So far, we have seen the vision of Jesus. Do you remember it? That breathless description of the resurrected, glorified Christ. And we saw the woes to the seven churches. We saw the three courses of the seven judgments of God against evil. And the marriage supper of the lion lamb of, of God. And we saw the return of Christ to reign on the earth. And the three stages of the removal of all evil from the earth. Thrown into the lake of fire. All that. And now chapter 21 introduces the new heaven, and the new earth. All of that had to happen. It had to happen in the way that it did, and it had to happen in the way that it's going to happen. I'm speaking in past tense because we've read it, because God has said it, but it's yet to happen. In today's uh, scripture, I want to, to give you the breakdown of the outline so that you've got it in the back of your mind. The new vision is described in the first two verses, in 1 and 2. Then God explains the significance of His presence with us, 3 and 4. Then God describes the new heavenly order, 5 and 6. And then God challenges the reader to be an overcomer, to not be a coward in the face of today. In today's day. This was written 2,000 years ago, but it was written to us. Verses 7 and 8. So we begin. Verse 1. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now, there's a lot to unpack here. This is not new in time, like the next moment, or like the next improvement, but it is new in kind. Not new in time, but new in kind. 
It isn't that the old thing is made better. It's that the old thing is replaced by something completely different. Different of kind. It's like the difference between a mule and a tractor. You guys don't know about mules. It's like the difference between an ink pen and a computer. It's that different. That's what the new means here. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, the first heaven was under the bondage, I'm sorry, the first earth was under the bondage of sin. It isn't just that sin is removed. That would be, that would be significant. That would be amazing. But it isn't just that sin is removed. It's that perfection, holiness, becomes the state of being. And we're going to get into how it talks about these things negatively in a moment. But this, to, but wrap your mind around this idea of what's packed into this idea of newness. That holiness is the way of being. Now, sinfulness is the way of being. The sinful nature has corrupted the whole of creation. That's one of the reasons why we're so glad that God was not created. Because He is not changed by sin. But we were. But not only is that change removed, but holiness becomes our state of being. Ah, amazing. The first earth was under the bondage of sin. Genesis says, the first heavens have suffered a rebellion of angelic beings. Even heaven was suffering from the rebellious nature. And all that has been thrown into the lake of fire, never to be let go, never to be retrieved. It says, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. Gone. Not there. Can't go visit it. It's gone. The heavens. The first heavens. Heavens. Satan and all his rebellious angels are in the lake of fire, never to return. The old is done away. And the earth, all unbelieving, unfaithful, unregenerated humanity into the lake of fire, never to return. Done away with. Then it's followed with this amazing statement. I mean, that would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> That's worthy of dancing. But then there's this statement. And there is no longer any sea. And you recognize, you remember, that the sea is the site of the origin of rebellion. It's not the water. It's what the water represents. It's the place. There's no longer, do you, you get what's happening? There's no longer any sea. The sea is the site of evil. That means there's no place for evil to come from. There can't be any more evil because the place that it comes from is gone. Do you get it? It's not just that the old evil is removed, but that there's no possibility of a new evil. Let me in. There's no possibility of a new evil. Verse 
verse 2. John says, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, after this statement, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, after this statement, there are no other statements of a descending of heaven. Well, there is a mention of it in verse 10, but it's a restatement of what's happening here. The point is this, that the heavens of God, the abode of God, and the earth of humanity, the abode of humanity, are joined together. Can't imagine that. I've always lived in this dichotomy, in this divergence of this is earth and that is heaven. But the new heaven and the new earth make one. Isn't it like God? You just see him doing that over and over again, making two things into one, reconciling two things together. It's glorious. They have been joined. And they're joined in what he calls the holy city. The holy city. It's community. It's interdependent human community with God present. It's not the buildings, the parks, the factories. You've got to work somewhere. The shops. You've got to buy somewhere. Okay, the restaurants. It's not the restaurants of heaven. That's not the point. But rather, the holy city is the people. Finally, living in perfect harmony. Can you imagine that? Now, we get along with each other pretty well, although some of you just sit really far from one another, but that's just us. But can you imagine a humanity that you actually love and love to serve. Love to actively serve. Finally. Finally. A community of divinely loving people with God and with each other. He said he saw the holy city. It's holy. The new Jerusalem. It's holy. The holy city. Coming down. Down from holiness. Out of heaven. The seat of holiness. From God. Holy, holy, holy. Do you get the point? You think it's got something to do with holiness? Made ready by God's doing to be a bride adorned. Adorned in the holiness of God. Amazing. In the holiness of God. For her husband. For the holy God. Holiness comes down and unites itself as the way of being. Truly. Truly. It is almost too much. It is almost overwhelmingly powerful. My heart can't take it. It is amazing. He has been promising for 7,000 years at this point, we're at the 6,000 year point, but at this point where, he's, where this is happening, he's been promising this. Promising it since Genesis. Promising it. That he will make his abode with us. He's been promising that he will join us together with him. That he would join us in love, in harmony, in peace, in holiness. That he would join
join us together in himself. And now, verse 3, John says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne. Who do you suppose this is speaking? This is the authoritative voice of God. This is the marvelous voice of God. And what is he saying? Behold! <laughs> Don't miss this, he says. This is significant. This is important. This is vital. This is what I'm trying to get you to see. Don't miss this. Behold, the tabernacle of God, the living place of God, the being place of God, the holiness place where only, only the high priest selected for that moment can go in one day, the day of atonement, one day a year, and, and only in complete righteousness, otherwise he's killed. That holy place is now among men, humanity, with us in this loud voice from the throne, this magnificent voice of God says, and he will dwell among them. With, around, between, his choice of living place is with you. The proof of that is that His Holy Spirit now dwells in you. His choice of place of being is with you. He goes on to say, and they will be His people, marked with His name, living His glory, doing His will. And God Himself, John writes, and God Himself, God says, will be among there's a beautiful chiasm. It's almost a chiasm. It's more of a parallelism here. But if you'll look, listen to how this falls together. The tabernacle of God is among men. And He will dwell among them. And they will be His people. And God Himself will be among them. God is wrapping Himself around It's written this way to assure us of its certainty. This isn't a might be. This is a gonna be. God is saying, this is how it's going to be for you. This is how it's going to be for you. My holiness will be the core of your being. Hallelujah! Don't let this slip away from you. This is God speaking. Yes. He is saying yes to you. It is true, He is speaking in third person here. But wait for verse 5. But in verse 4, he tells us that it, of what it will mean for us that he is with us. Verse 4. And he continues to say, God says, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, and the first things have Pass away. 
This is what it's going to be like. This is the character of God in community. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. His personal hand. His own hand to see your tears. And His hand to be the compassion for your soul. He gets you. He understands you. Intimately, personally. He knows how broken, how hurt, how misused, how, how, how tearful you are. He understands it all. And with His own hand, His compassion will come over you and fix everything. You believe that? He does. He does. And He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. A personal hand. And there will no longer be any death. Death entered into the world because of sin. And it brought the separation. And it's gone. Sin, our rebellion against God, and separation, our separation from God, are removed, are gone. There will no longer be any death. It's not just that we live eternally, but that we live eternal, holy lives. We live eternal holy lives. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning. Grief and loss is what's being thought of here. We have all lived long enough, all of us, to have suffered loss, to have grieved. Some of us have lived a long time and had and had the piling on, the multiple griefs. Some of us have lived a very short time, but had catastrophic breaking of our soul, of our spirit. Great grief and loss. In God, there will no longer be any No, no purpose of grief. Grief gone away. No, no more grief. No more mourning. No more loss. There will no longer be any crying. The result of sin. All of our heartache all of our loss, all of our pain, all of our suffering has been a result of sin. Ours or someone else's. But it's all come from that. There was no crying. There was no sin. There was no shame. There was no pain. Until the fall. And now God has removed it. No more crying. No more result of sin. It's impossible. We cannot conceive. We cannot wrap our mind around that. Because it's been our way of being. But we see it in Jesus. And that's why it's so important for us to be absolutely concrete in our understanding of Him. And our ability to hold on to seeing Jesus. Sinless. Perfect. Holiness. Do you, do you understand that in a poll of, of people that call themselves evangelical, that over half of them, just barely, but over half of them said that, well, yes, at some point in Jesus' life, he must have sinned. Do you understand that that's completely impossible? That Christ never sinned. He had the Spirit of God carrying through the temptations. 
No more crying, the results of sin. There will no longer be any pain. This is the physical suffering. And some of us in this hall have suffered long time with constant pain. Gone. It will be gone. Some of you have been healed from pain. Hallelujah. Praise God. And some of you will be healed. But in this economy that he's talking about, in this way of being, in his holiness, there is no physical pain. I don't know what the carpenters are going to do with their hammers. I guess maybe you'll just spit nails out. They'll never hit their thumbs. They'll always hit the mark. He says the first things have passed away. Gone. Not to be brought back. Not to be visited. There's no place for them to come from again. Right? There's no longer any sea. There's no place for these things to come, come back with. And God has wiped away all the effects. The old order of things has passed away. Now, you've noticed that it's been presented in the negation of things, and the, the negative end, the tears, the death, the mourning, the crying, the pain, all gone. It's easier for us to understand the new order from what it isn't than from what it is. What's not there. Because we can't hardly imagine the new reality. If we will get closer to Jesus now in this reality, we'll, we will begin to understand more and more of it. It can only be seen in this time. It can only be seen in Christ. And that's why I encourage you. If you know pain, if you know crying, if you know loss, if you know mourning, if you know any of sin and separation, if you've ever had a tear, the answer is Jesus. The answer is getting closer to Him. Because we can't hardly imagine the new reality. Our experience of Faith, hope, and love has always been tainted with sin. Our experience of God has always been tainted with our selfishness, our own focus on ourself. But look at verse 5. And he who sits on the throne, this is the same that we recognize as the authority speaking, said, Behold, don't miss it. Behold, this continues to be of supreme importance. And he changes the pronoun. Now he says, I. I am making all things new. Of a new kind. Of the kind out of his own personality. And he said, Right, for these things are faithful and true. He assures us with his own word that his glory, his blessing, his magnificence, his holiness will be the new order of reality. He himself will be the order of all life. He says in verse 6, Then he, God, said to me, John, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, 
and I will be his God, and he will be my son. If it stopped here, if God stopped speaking in verse 7, there would still be enough to drive us onward and deeper and upward. It would be enough for us to build our lives around Jesus for the rest of our lives. The promises of God with us completed, fulfilled, experienced, But there's something about the disconnect between our experience of Christ and the reality of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is why Jesus had to start this letter with the letter to the seven churches. And out of those seven churches that had a glorious history, only one of them was applauded and one other was recognized as similarly healthy. But five of the churches who had been filled with the Holy Spirit who were true churches of God were in fatal jeopardy. He didn't stop at verse 7 with its promise of the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and the giving of the water of the springs of life without cost. Even in verse 7 you hear the undertone. He who overcomes. Remember we talked about all through this book the theme of perseverance. 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 He who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God. And he will be my son. Verse 8. But the cowardly. And the unbelieving. And the abominable. And murderers. And immoral persons. And sorcerers. And idolaters. And all liars. Their part will be in the lake of fire, the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars. It's a terrible list. Remember I told you last week, these things are done away with. After the, the unbelievers are thrown into the lake of fire, these things are gone. And it's not mentioned again, except in this passage. It means that it's now. Another thing I think that is peculiar 
is these are horrible things. Unbelieving. Unbelieving sounds like a like a small thing, but, but think about it. To, to deny the God that created you, that's what it means in this unbelieving. To sneer at your creator. That's what it's saying. That's bad. That's terribly bad. The unbelieving, abominable, we, we know that that's bad. Murderers, we know that's bad. Immoral persons, we know that's bad. Sorcerers, bad. Idolaters, bad. Liars, bad. But the cowardly? Why cowardly? We're all cowards at some time. Why the cowardly? How could you put coward in the same, in the same category as a sorcerer or a murderer? Or a blasphemer. Cowardly? He actually, God, in his writing this, in his saying this, he actually couches this whole section, this, this, this whole list, under the, under the, the superheading of cowardly. That to be an unbeliever is to be a coward. To be abominable is to be a coward. To be a murderer is to be a coward. To be immoral is cowardly. A sorcerer, an idolater, a liar is to be a coward. today is, will we be overcomers or will we be cowards? This is the question each one of you have to ask yourself. Will it be for you the new heaven and the new earth or will it be for you the lake of fire and brimstone which is the second death? Today decides it. Today decides it. You make your decision every day. Now I'm not talking about losing your salvation. I'm talking about losing Jesus in this life. And let me tell you, it's possible because the church has largely lost him. Five of the seven letters are to churches that have lost Jesus. And we live in a culture of churches that don't know the faith, hope, and love of Jesus Christ. This new heaven and this new earth are being prepared for the sons of God. For the sons of God and for the daughters of God. Not the pretenders. Not the liars. Have you given yourself totally to the Spirit of God? Or are you still intent on having your own kingdom? Having your own kingdom here on this miserable This earth it groans for the salvation. You have got to let go of the old and take hold of the new today. If you will be part of the new heaven and the new earth, you have to start living it today. Take hold.
would challenge you today to consider what are the evidences that the Spirit of God is alive in your life? Will you today come to Christ for His fullness? And from this day forward, be totally committed to Him. Our song of commitment is, We come, O Christ, to you, true Son of God and man, by whom all things consist, and who all life begin. In you alone we live and move and have our being in you in your love. If you sing this and you don't totally commit, that makes you a liar. I pray you choose Christ. And number 199, will you stand with me? be his God and he will be my son.